The title of my message this morning is The Sin of David. We're going to talk about King David. And it's going to come from the book of First Chronicles in chapter 17. And I've got several long passages in here that we're going to read together. And we're going to dive into uh, some awesome things that God did in David's life. But we're also going to take a look at some failure that he had in his life. First Chronicles, chapter 17, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass, when David was dwelling in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, See how I dwell in a house of cedar. But the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under tent curtains. David goes to Nathan. Nathan, I have a house of cedar. Uh, it was a new house. It was built... Uh, he was the king of Israel, and he looks at himself and thinks, I'm a king, and I have this very nice house to dwell in, and the place where the very presence of God rests is in a tent. Now, how many of you in here are campers? And how many of you like to go camping, but you like to do it in style? You like to do it with a motor home? How many of you like to go camping in tents? See, me and Christy, we took Morgan and Mason camping once when they were very young. It was Boy Scout camp. And we went camping. We set up a tent. And the four of us got in there. And it was in the summer, in the middle of summer. And it was hot and sweaty and sticky. I don't have any desire to be in a tent in the middle of summer. And I've never, been, I've never been camping in winter either, so I can assume that it's probably just a horrible experience in the winter, right? You got tents. So anyways, the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of God dwelled, was in a tent. And... The king of Israel, he decides, I'm living in a palace, basically, a nice cedar house, and the Ark of the Covenant is in a tent. Then Nathan said to David, do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. But it happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan. So David had some things in his heart that he wanted to do, but David's counsel, the word of God came to Nathan, David's counsel. And he said, Then Nathan, do what is in your heart, for God is with you. But it happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, You shall not build me a house to dwell in, for I have not dwelt in a house since that time, that I brought up Israel even to this day, but have gone from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another. Whenever I have moved about with all Israel, have I ever spoken a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold from following the sheep to be a ruler over my people, Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and cut off all your enemies from before you and have made you a name like the name of the great men who are on earth. <clears throat> Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more, as previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. Also, I will subdue all your enemies. Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house, and it shall be then your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him, as it 
as I took it from him who was before you. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So Nathan was a counselor for the king. He was his good friend, and he came to him, and he said, this is what the Lord says. And it was, this was the covenant that God made with David. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take out of your seed the king that is going to be the king forever. Now, we know who that is, right? He was talking about his son, Samuel, that was going to build the temple, but he was also foreshadowing Jesus, that he was going to build his kingdom forever. So even though the king's desire of his heart was to build a temple right then, he said, it's not time yet. He said, it's not time, but I'm going to take you and I'm going to establish my people. And then we will establish the temple that is to be built. But more importantly, we're going to establish the temple that's going to hold the presence of God forever. It's talking about when Jesus come and we have the indwelling of Christ in us. <clears throat> when David heard this, we read in, in, and that was out of verse, uh, chapter 17, in the very next verse, Verse 16, this was what King David did after Nathan came and spoke to him. And this was really a show of David's humility. And this is one of the reasons why God loved David so much and put so much faith and trust into David. It was because of his humility that after his advisor came to him and told him all this stuff, it says in verse 16, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. He went in and he bowed himself before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? He, he goes in and tells God, God, it, it's all about you, God, that you have even brought me this far. And who am I? I who am I? Even though he was the king of Israel, he says, who am I that you would have even brought me this far? And so if you go in and you read the rest of that, that chapter, he, he talks about the works of God and the goodness of God. And you really see the heart of David in that moment of him being humble and just, just bowing his heart towards God and saying, God, I need you. You're so good. You've blessed me. Now, how many of us know this morning <clears throat> that that is an attitude of worship? Amen. That's an attitude of recognizing, God, I can only do things because of you. Amen. And that's a proper attitude to have. Amen. God, it's all about you. God, I want to build you this big house to put your spirit in. But God, you come to me and you tell me now's not the time. You're not the one that's going to do it. Okay, God, but whatever you want me to do, I'll do it because it's all about you. And so if you go through and you read chapter 18, the, the title in my Bible before chapter 18, the title says David's Further Conquests. And it talks about the wars and the way that God delivers them. In chapter 19, it talks about the fall of the Ammonites and the Syrians and how they were defeated. More about David's conquest and then in chapter 20, it talks about Rabbah being conquered. And so we get to this point in chapter 20 where there's been three chapters and all it is is about David's conquest and how David has been successful and how David has overcome the enemy and his adversary and everything in that. And in all those chapters, it talks about how David has honored God's and God, the one true God, in those moments and recognize God and giving God the glory because of that. But here in chapter 20, where Rabbah is conquered, we're going to read a verse 1 through 8. And I believe that this shows 
this shows where David's heart started to turn. Verse 1 in chapter 20, it says, This was the same time... Uh, no, I wrote a note. It says, This was the same time that David was tempted and sinned with Bathsheba. So his heart was already turned away from God. But verse 1, it says, It happened in the spring of the year at the time of kings to go out to battle, that Joab led out the armed forces and ravaged the country of the people of Ammon, but came and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem, and Joab defeated Rabbah and overthrew it. And so after this, Joab would have sent for King David, and David come, it says, Then David took their king's crown from his head and found it to weigh a talent of gold. And there were precious stones in it, and it was set on David's head. A king's crown. This is the first time that David wears, wears a crown like this where it's encrusted with jewels and it's made of gold. And it was, it was a crown of the kings of the earth, but it was set on his head. And I believe that this signifies a start of where David's heart was not in a very good place. <clears throat> Also, he brought out the spoil of the city in great abundance, and he brought out the people who were in it and put them to work with saws and irons and picks and axes. So David did to all the cities of people of Ammon. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Now it happened afterward that war broke out at Gezer with the Philistines, at which time Sabethani the Hushkakite killed Sippai who was one of the sons of the giant, and they were subdued. Again, there was war in the Philistines, and Elihan, the son of Jer, killed Lamini, the brother of Goliath, the Gillette. The shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again, there was war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature with 24 fingers and toes, six on each hand and six on each foot. And he was also born to the giants. So when he defeated his, when he defiled Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemiah, David's brother, killed him. These were born to the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. And so you see King David in previous chapters of the Bible where he was just a young shepherd boy and he came and he conquered he conquered the giant Goliath and it comes full circle back into where they're in Gath again and David has his army and they conquered more giants it was one of Goliath's, Goliath's brother and they conquered more giants and so at this point it's a real turning point for King David where he had relied on God and said, God, you know, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to be obedient and all these things. But here we're going to look at First Chronicles chapter 21, starting with verse 1. And King David decides to take a census of all the fighting men in the nation of Israel. And verse 1 says, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, from the north and to the south. That's what that represented. And bring the number of them to me that I may know it. See, God didn't direct King David to do a census. David just wanted to know it. He's like, I want to know how big my army is. And so now you start to see the thought process of King David and what he's thinking. How big is my army? See, King David started out with about 600 men. And he was living in a cave. And he was, he was uh, running from Saul. And he relied on God. But now we get into this place where 
the crown has been set onto his head and some pride has welled up into him. And he says, go out and number my, man, my men because I want to know how great my army is. And Joab answered, may the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord re require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? <clears throat> Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. King David said, you're going to do it because I'm the king and I want it. He went from a place in his life where he heeded the voice of his counselor, Nathan. And then it comes to Joab and Joab says, don't do this. I plead with you, King David, do not do this. And he says, I'm the king. We're going to do it my way. <clears throat> How many of you this morning, church, have ever had to have it your way? Maybe even when you knew it wasn't the right thing, but you had it in your heart. I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to do. Husbands, wives. I mean, can we be real or not? Have you ever had somebody come and honey, I don't think this is the right thing. We shouldn't be doing this. What are you talking about? I'm the man of the house. We're going to do it my way or no way. You don't have to point fingers. You don't have, you, you ain't got to come up to me after this and say, uh, Pastor Clay, you were really speaking to my spirit right then. Uh, because uh, let me tell you what happened. That's not what this is about. This is a time for self-examination, church. Therefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave the sum of the number to people of David. All Israel had one million, one hundred thousand men who drew sword. And Judah had 470,000 men who drew sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. Joab knew the trouble that King David was getting to. Joab knew that there was a spirit of pride upon King David. And King David was looking at himself right now, and he said, you know what? I used to be in a cave with 600 men and all this kind of stuff, and I was relying on God. But right now, I don't even have to rely on God. I've got security in my army. I've got 110,000 men. I'm going to be king for a long time. Can you just hear it this morning, church? The pride that was in him. What can come against me? I've got a huge army. I've defeated all the other armies. I am a king of this world. He, he took the gold crown and put it on his head. But have any of us this morning ever been prideful like that? You ever look at your bank account? Man, I got so much money in my bank right now. Somebody's laughing. They either had a lot of money or had none. I got so many, I got so many friends and family around me to back me up, and they're gonna take care of me. And and you should see my stock portfolio. It's so huge. <clears throat> So much pride in the things of this earth. See, David had put in his hope and his trust in his army instead of clinging to Jesus, instead of clinging to God. But how many of us, and I'm going to get real this morning because I'm going to talk about something that is in the church. And you can shout me down and say it's not true or you can open up your heart and you can consider this. What about those of us that would look at the political landscape this morning and say, well, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. And, 
and you're putting your faith and your hope in that. If, if you go to somebody and all you can talk about is who won or who lost the election, and you're not saying a single word about Jesus, what does that mean? And I'm going to let you answer that this morning. I'm going to let the Spirit of God speak to your heart this morning. Because when all these things, when we, you look at King David, he had saw God move. He had saw God conquer the armies. God walked with him. And the only reason that he was where he was, he was in that place and he bowed before God and he said, God, who am I? that you would have brought me to this place. He didn't sit there before the Lord and say, God, I'm a Republican. And I believe that somebody else should be in the White House right now. And I put my faith in what's going on with that. He didn't, church, he didn't say that. He said, God, who am I? He humbled himself before God and he clung, to, he clung on to God with all that he had. He didn't make it about him. He made it about God. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he struck Israel. God was disgusted by the fact that his chosen one had made it about himself and not kept it about God. So Israel was struck. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. God allowed this thing to happen in his life. And, and it goes on in the chapter and tells uh, that the prophet came to King David and said, you got three choices. You can either be pursued for three months by your enemies. Uh, you can have a seven year famine or you can be dealt with by God for three days. And he chose to be dealt with by God. And then he repented and he asked God, please, he said, God, please relent. And God ends up having mercy on him. But in that, there was 60,000 of his men that was slain because of the sin of his pride. That's, that's how serious, church, that's how serious God takes the sin of pride. Now, we live under a new covenant and God is way more gracious and merciful with us. This was under the old covenant. But that's how... God views pride. He doesn't like it. But David repents. And this is in chapter 22 of the same book. There at the end of chapter 21, he goes to Ornan the Jebusite. And he says, I've got to make a sacrifice to God. I've got to right my wrong." which Jesus rots our wrongs. Amen. But in this time, he goes, he said, I've got to make a sacrifice. He goes to Ornan the Jebusite at the threshing floor. And he says, I'm going to buy this place and buy all your cattle. And he says, King, I will give it to you. The king says, no, it wouldn't be a sacrifice then. If you gave everything to me, how could I call it a sacrifice? He said, I'm going to pay you for it. He pays him for it. He makes the sacrifice. And then in chapter 22, verse 1, it says, Then David said, This is the house of the Lord. And this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. So all of a sudden in this moment, God brings him to the place in his repentance. And he says, This is where I'm going to build my house. This is where the presence of God is going to come and rest. This is going to set things in motion for the rest of human history that's going to change it. And this is where the presence of God is going to be. This is where your son Solomon is going to build the temple. And the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords 
going to come from this place because you humbled yourself once again. How many of us know in here, church, if you call yourself a child of God, that it's easy to get down on yourself because you feel like you don't do things right? See, I'm not here this morning to tell you how bad you've been. I'm not here this morning to tell you that you're so far gone. See, quite the opposite. I'm here to tell you that God is going to deal with you graciously. And that He's got to... This morning, I didn't understand it until I've, I've preached this message. But during worship, that word that God says... He wants to do something in you this morning. I believe that God wants to remind you that He has a plan for you this morning. In spite of your failures. See, King David, what was he called? A man after God's own heart. A man that was pursuing God and he got some pride in him and he sinned against God. But he humbled himself and he said, God, I'm sorry. He even asks during that three days of the plague that came upon Israel, he says, God, take it off of, my, of your people and put it on me because I have sinned against you. See, when we confess our sins, God is swift and just to forgive us. Amen. See, God's calling you out this morning, church. And I don't know if anybody in here has ever been prideful. I've spoken about this several times. But I've been bad about saying, you know, I can handle it. You know, it's, it's, I've got this. But when we make it about ourselves... And we forsake the truth, which is it should be about Him. Then we open up the door for some calamity. Amen? Worship team, would you come back this time? See, this should be a, a word, a message of encouragement this morning. The man of God, church, the man of God that was after God's own heart, messed up, right? But even after he messed up, the man of God repented. And God said, okay, I'm going to bring you into the, I'm going to bring you to the place where you're going to build my temple. And you would think after he messed up, he had an affair with a, a married woman. He had the married woman's husband killed. He had so much pride in him, he took a census so he could just marvel at his own greatness. Does that sound like a man after God's own heart? It doesn't. But I know that there's people in this place this morning that when they stumble a little bit, they feel like they're not worthy to carry God's water. But that's not the truth, is it? See, God still loves us, and He still wants to use us. And that's a reason to shout this morning. God still loves us, and He still wants to use us. Amen? Let's rise to our feet. We're going to pray, and I'm going to let, let us be dismissed in music. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. My prayer is that our hearts would be renewed this morning. In spite of our failures and our flaws and all the junk that we have going on in our life, God, you still desire to use us to advance your kingdom. God, we pray that we would be encouraged in you this morning, not in ourselves, not in our own abilities, 
not in our own plans. You, you saw the plans of David. He wanted to build you a, a temple right where he was at. And you said, it's not time. And just because you told him it wasn't time right there didn't mean that you wasn't still going to use him. So my prayer this morning, God, is that you would just reveal yourself to us in a new way, God. Give us hope and encouragement in you, God. Not in ourselves, not in our bank account, not in, in the things, the cares of this world, the things that this world has set up. But God, we pray that our hearts would be pointed to you and only you this morning. God, we confess that we don't have it all figured out. But God, we believe that you don't make mistakes. And so we pray that you'd be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.